Hello and welcome to the Brex Fenedge and Rivers Landscape Partnership Schemes River Raiders project. Delivered by the Breckland Society and presented by Dr Richard Hoggett, this is the first of two seminars and will provide an overview of the historical and archaeological evidence for the Viking presence in East Anglia and the Breckland area in particular. There will be a significant emphasis on the role which Thetford played as a Viking camp and later Anglo-Scandinavian township in which the Viking army overwintered before defeating Edmund in battle in AD 869. The River Raiders project will be exploring the history and impact of the Vikings in the Breck through research and field work delivered by volunteers from across the region. Particularly significant events such as the martyrdom of King Edmund at the hands of the Vikings will be high on the agenda but less well-known factors such as the role which the Vikings played in the establishment and development of Thetford will also be explored. Project activities will include training in archaeological and historical research skills and practical field work and will result in the publication of an illustrated report, the installation of an interpretation panel and creation of online resources. Volunteers will also have a role in curating a Viking themed exhibition to be held at Ancient House Museum in Thetford. Brex Fenedge and Rivers Landscape Partnership Scheme itself is hosted by Suffolk County Council and supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The scheme will deliver 24 core projects through a wide range of partners. By engaging with local communities, the scheme seeks to understand, reveal, celebrate and protect the lost heritage of the Brex Fenedge and Rivers. It will raise awareness of how water is fundamental to the story of landscape settlement and development its biodiversity and to many of its existing and future risks. Partners and volunteers will restore rivers and sensitive freshwater habitats with communities encouraged to value heritage and given the skills to maintain it into the future. The following seminar has been edited for clarity so let's join Dr Richard Hoggett straight away to find out more about the historical and archaeological evidence for the Viking presence in East Anglia and the Breckland area in particular. Moving on to the, the main focus of this morning then, what I want to do is try and infuse you with a, an overview of the rich Anglo-Saxon and Viking archaeology that we have within uh, with, well, within the Brex and within the, the, the Brex study area that we're looking at at the moment more particularly, within the river valleys in the western part of the, uh, the, the Brex. Now uh, I'm just going to switch my pointer back on uh, because what I want to begin with is uh, is this map. Um, maps are important and they, they, they help us understand the, the physical and um, the, the, the sort of cultural geography of where we are. And so this is a map showing you uh, what East Anglia would have looked like in terms of physical geography during the period which we're thinking about. And as I mentioned earlier on, that's really the 5th century through to about the, uh, the 11th century in terms of the, the Norman conquest. Now this map is showing you uh, areas of, of peat and alluvial soils, so um, water-based flooding effectively, so you can see large areas of the wash on the western side here, you can see the river channels coming inland, and uh, then the slightly the buff coloured land here is land over the, the whopping height of, of 60 metres, these are the, the highlands if you like of East Anglia uh, being uh, demonstrated on this map. But what I hope this map shows you, just by colouring it in blue really as much as anything, is quite how riddled with river networks the entire region is. And in particular, how many river networks there are in this uh, western uh, East Anglia part here, linking into the Fens, linking into the, uh, the, the Fen edge. And as I've mentioned, the, the point of what we're talking about today really is the significance of those river valley corridors to the early settlers in the, the Anglo-Saxon period and then the Viking settlers uh, a little bit later on. Now, um, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, with maps like this, uh, which give us this flavour of where the Anglo-Saxon settlers has come from. I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. I could fill a whole separate lecture with discussions of, of the, the ending of Roman Britain, what was happening in the fifth century, and um, where the, the Anglo-Saxon settlers were coming from, um, and indeed um, how many there are, you know, whether, whether we're looking at a, a sort of vast swathe of uh, settlers coming over, or whether it's a few people and bringing their culture with them, uh, opinion seems to vary. But archaeologically, at least, we, we definitely see uh, material uh, being brought from one place to another, and we definitely see shifts in cultural evidence. Now, based on historical sources, particularly on um, the, the writings of Bede, 
uh, we have maps like this, the sort of dad's army approach, if you like, to um, migrations in the fifth century, um, where we see um, famously the Jutes uh, coming and settling uh, in the Kentish area, um, where we see the Angles coming across and settling in uh, northern East Anglia and up into the uh, eastern seaboard in here. And then uh, we see the Saxons taking up uh, residence in southern East Anglia and uh, in the parts of, of southern England. And so you can see uh, this direct connection between uh, the Angles over the sea and the Angles in East Anglia. And so again, um, you can see where this cultural transmission is coming from. And what maps like this serve to highlight is the importance of the sea and the importance of rivers as a major um, connecting corridor, if you like, between peoples. And particularly in this period from the, the fifth century onwards, it's the North Sea Basin, which is absolutely crucial to our understanding of um, culture and interaction between peoples. Now, uh, the next slide uh, it gives you a, a greater flavour of that. And um, this is something I owe to Tom Williamson, who uh, many of you know, I'm sure, uh, which gives us a, uh, a Scandinavian, if you like, and sort of Northern European perspective on the North Sea Basin. We're very used to looking at the map the other way up. Um, but if you flip it this way around, if you're a, a Norwegian or a, a Swede or you're a Dane, uh, or even if you're a, a Frisian in here on the, the North German and Dutch coast, you have a very different perspective on the North Sea. And I hope that this map gives you a flavour of the fact that actually it's quite a discrete enclosing basin. And you can see how um, Northern East Anglia and the Wash in particular here um, feeds directly in to this network. If you set off in a straight line from one to the other, you're funneled into the Wash and you end up uh, in West Norfolk and uh, West Suffolk and in the Brex area. So I hope that again, you can see what's being uh, suggested by this map. What's also quite interesting about this map is the fact that um, Belgium and France and uh, even Holland to a certain extent, you can see a very much round the corner uh, in, uh, in ideological terms here. So you can see uh, that there's much more of a sort of cross channel focus uh, between southeastern England and, and the uh, northern part of the continent. Whereas within East Anglia or northern East Anglia in particular, there's a much greater focus on the North Sea itself without wishing to labour that point too far. It's also quite telling that that's pretty much the edge of the Roman Empire as well. This line through here, the Rhine, it's pretty much the edge of the Roman Empire. And so everything that, that lay uh, to the east and north of the Rhine was basically barbarian territory and outside the classical world. And again, the fact that you've got um, this kind of interaction of peoples from outside of the Roman world uh, coming into East Anglia, again, gives us that cultural connection. And that's something that we see time and time again through the history, but also through um, the material culture as well. Now, I'll just give you this map by way of a, a brief overview. And um, this is uh, from the Historical Atlas of Norfolk, which is a, a fantastically useful resource. Uh, it does exactly what it says on the tin in terms of being a, uh, an atlas of, of different periods of, of Norfolk's history. Um, this is the map showing you the extent of, of early Saxon settlements and cemeteries uh, across the region. And again, you can see just very clearly on this map, there's a definite clustering of sites in the western seaboard of, of Norfolk, as you might expect, given the, the comments I've just been making. Um, the Boulder Clay Plateau through the centre, uh, more sparsely settled, with the exception, it should be added, of this Spong Hill area in the centre here, which sits very much on a large navigable river valley. And I think even just from a very basic distribution like that, um, it's very clear to see there are quite strong correlations between uh, areas of known settlement and known cemetery and areas of substantial river valleys. And that obviously includes uh, down here in, in southwest Norfolk, uh, much of the area that's then incorporated within our current study area. And I can show you the equivalent map from the Suffolk, the historical atlas of Suffolk, uh, which again is, is the similar thing, um, slightly older. So uh, the data in it is a little bit more behind, but um, probably in need of an update, but it still gives you the, the sense of exactly that same distribution. So again, uh, in this western part of Suffolk, again, taking in much of the area that we're talking about at the moment, there's the Lark through here, for example, uh, a very dense area of Anglo-Saxon settlement indeed, uh, expanding up the river networks, as you can see quite clearly. 
And this is, is very obviously the result of uh, waterborne people um, basically bringing their boats down through across the North Sea and down into the, the entrances to navigable river valleys and then settling along the banks of those river valleys. And you can see that very, very clearly through this area that, that we're interested in. Again, tellingly, the, the upper sort of highlands, if you remember that shaded map and the, the boulder clay plateau through the centre here, um, less well settled. Um, more recent field work has added a few more dots to the map, um, but really this gap through the middle here uh, remains as a, as a genuine gap in the settlement. And then we have a corresponding settlement uh, density down here in southeastern Suffolk, focusing around Sutton Hoo um, and Rendlesham. And obviously those of you who are into these kind of things will be familiar with both the Rendlesham project. I gather we're up against them this morning. I think they're doing a, an online seminar as well. Um, but you can watch them both on catch up. It's fine. Um, but um, there's also obviously, of course, a, a major focus with the, the Royal uh, Estate there at, at Rendlesham and the Royal Burial Ground at Sutton Hoo. So we have really within Suffolk, especially two key areas of settlement. You've got West Suffolk and the Brex, and then you've got South East Suffolk and the Sandlings. And the crucial thing about both of those, as you can see, is that they're navigable um, with deep river valleys uh, penetrating very far inland. And that's a key characteristic of both areas. Now, in terms of what that settlement evidence looks like, uh, again, the, the, the current study area is incredibly rich and it allows us to appreciate uh, what uh, what we might have seen uh, back in the 5th, 6th and 7th centuries uh, in terms of settlement. And one of the key sites for us understanding that is West Stowe and the Anglo-Saxon village site at West Stowe. Um, again, I'm sure many of you, uh, local residents at least, will, will perhaps be familiar with West Stowe uh, through visiting the site or, or maybe through um, events that you, you've seen held locally. Um, but what I'd just like to do is just quickly take you through some of the archaeological evidence for West Stowe, because even though, as you can see at the top of the screen there, excavated in 1965, although some earlier excavations uh, started a, a little before that, uh, the, the bulk of the excavations, 1965 to 72, um, it still remains one of our key, what we call a type site in archaeological terms. It's, it's the one we all go to when we're trying to identify and interpret other sites like it. And one of the reasons for that is because it still to this day remains one of the most extensively excavated examples of an early Anglo-Saxon settlement, um, sat on the banks of the Lark uh, in the, the River Valley, um, right within our, our current study area. Now the, um, the, the banner you can see on the left hand side there is, is what greets you when you visit the site today. It's now having been a, an archaeological site, it's now a, an ongoing archaeological experiment and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but it's branded as the first English village. Uh, four words and um, only four slight areas of, of controversy within that title. Um, as you'll see over the coming slides, um, the idea that it's the, uh, it's one of many, uh, the idea that it's first, probably isn't. Uh, the fact it's English, it's more likely to be Anglo as uh, Angles as we've seen, and the fact it might not be a village either. But apart from that, it's a brilliant tagline and it works very well. But, but the point is that the archaeology from the site, which is recorded uh, in the volumes you can see on the screen here, and those are all available online. I'll send you the links to those afterwards as a follow-up email. Um, but the archaeology that was undertaken allows us to see uh, what the, the early Anglo-Saxon period effectively looked like. So you can see on the left hand side here, um, excavations underway, there's Stanley West who, who ran those excavations. And you can see on the right hand side, a uh, very illustrious visitor to the site indeed. Um, this is Basil Brown, um, who had originally carried out work at West Stowe uh, in the 1940s, um, hot on the heels of his work at, at Sutton Hoo, um, and who then subsequently visited the excavations and was captured on film here in his trademark hat. Uh, so a fantastic image, that one. But as you can see from the slide, the excavation is very, very extensive. Uh, and you can see that the archaeology itself is very shallow as well here. And um, this being Breckland, uh, we have a, a very thin soil, a very sandy soil. And one of the reasons why the site at West Stowe was so well preserved is because during the medieval period, 
and um, we had great sand dunes build up over the site through um, storms and wind particularly buried the site under a thick layer of sand which meant that the subsequent ploughing of the site or there wasn't much because it was heathland but where ploughing was undertaken it didn't penetrate deep enough to to start to destroy the archaeology and what that meant was that during the course of the excavation it was possible to produce uh, a very very detailed archaeological plan of very what we would call ephemeral archaeology so um, the archaeology of a settlement entirely made of wood uh, which had, had uh, decayed away almost entirely so the plan you can see on the screen is from the excavation monograph and it shows you the anglo-saxon phase what it's not showing here is all the other phases that were excavated and there's lots of prehistoric evidence as well we won't go into that today but what you can see on the screen here is that there are basically two main types of building on the site there's a rectangular timber hall, which you can see there, and another one over here, for example. Um, and then there are these hollows with post holes at either end, which are referred to as sunken featured buildings. Now, um, you can see that there are lots of them shown on here, but what this is showing you is something like 300 years worth of occupation all at once. And what we need to do is then break that down into time slices um, with a, a lifespan of maybe 20 years for a timber building before it starts to rot and the posts snap off. And uh, so what you're actually looking at here really is two or three main buildings with five or six associated buildings at any one time, uh, and then them gradually being replaced and replaced and replaced over a period of several hundred years. I won't go into that in more detail, um, but it gives you an idea that actually what you're looking at is one site being occupied for a long period of time by a few people rather than one site being occupied by a lot of people for not very much time. And that's a crucial distinction. Now, in terms of the archeology span itself, I mentioned it's ephemeral. Uh, this is what one of the timber halls looks like. And basically you can see that all that survives are the holes in the ground where the wooden posts were sunk. And the rest of it has, has disappeared completely. Uh, that's the timber hall, the, the rectangular building. Here's one of the corresponding sunken featured buildings. And again, hard to picture, and I'll come on to that in a moment, but you basically have this hollow in the ground with post holes at either end, which supported a timber superstructure, uh, which was effectively the building itself. And you can see how uh, once that timber building is gone, basically um, all trace of, of that structure has, has disappeared. We have different types of sunken featured building. This one is known as a two post building for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, this one is known as a six post building for again, I hope fairly obvious reasons. Um, and what this is suggesting is that there are differences of construction being used and different types of building uh, coming out of the ground. But again, archeologically, all we have is that series of post holes to go on. And I showed you the distribution map that gave you a, a sense of, of what, uh, what that would have looked like in terms of the spread across the hilltop. And uh, it's worth emphasizing that this is settlement basically on a knoll on the side of the river valley you know, with, with wet ground surrounding it. Now crucial clues were offered by the fact that two of the buildings at Westow had actually burnt down during the Anglo-Saxon period. And so here's a slide showing you the burnt remains of one of those buildings. And one of the crucial details as far as we're concerned is that the timbers survived, some of the burnt timbers have survived. And they tell us, first of all, that there's a, a burnt timber floor which sat over the hollow. Uh, so we know that there was a suspended floor above the ground and that people weren't living in a hole in the ground, Hobbit style, uh, which is what uh, some people thought at this particular point in time. We then in here, you can hopefully see these little donut shapes in the background here, these are a series of loom weights. Now these are, uh, see, I can see you all peering into your screens. That's good. There's a series of, um, of loom weights here. So these little clay uh, loops, which would have hung on the end of a loom and, and uh, allowed weaving to take place. And then crucially, over the top of those, uh, which are basically the contents of the building, we then have the burnt walls as well, which had fallen in on top of the floor. And this again is a vital clue that these buildings had timber walls rather than just being a, a roof over a hole in the ground. And so what that means is that it helped us with a, a very long standing debate about whether a sunken featured building should be reconstructed uh, like this as a basic sort of roof over a hole in the ground, or whether as the excavator Stanley West started to argue, it should be reconstructed as something like this, much more sophisticated timber walls and a thatched roof, but basically a full height building um, able to be walked into. And so following the excavations, 
at the uh, the end of the, the beginning of the 1970s, um, the second phase of what makes West so, so important was begun. And that was when the, the reconstruction project started. And those of you, again, who visited the site, well, I'm sure have seen uh, many of the reconstructions which are still there. Um, Westo now has become an ongoing piece of experimental archaeology. And here's a, a photograph from 1973 showing you one of the first buildings being reconstructed. And the idea here is that you have the same footprint as the archaeology. So you've got the, uh, the timber post holes going into the ground there. There's the hollow. And then everything else is conjectural reconstruction. And all the various buildings that you see on the site um, are uh, trying out different things. Um, different approaches to um, to the the uh, understanding of what these buildings might have looked like. Um, so uh, here um, we had a a few years ago there was uh, the fiftieth anniversary of the excavations came through the starting of the excavations. Um, so we took down one of the original buildings that was was rotting, and we had a couple of the original student uh, reconstructors come back that you can see uh, in this photograph here. And uh, to give you a flavour of what a degree in archaeology will do for you. Um, the, the gentleman on the right hand side here uh, went on to become a, a Jungian analyst and uh, the gentleman on the left hand side uh, went to join Katrina in the waves and wrote Walking on Sunshine and won the Eurovision Song Contest. So um, we've got quite a, a, a prestigious uh, set of volunteers again associated with the Westo Anglo-Saxon village. But that experiment hasn't finished either. If you go and visit the site today, you'll see that, uh, well, as soon as you can at least, you'll see that uh, there are many different types of building in evidence. As you can see in this photo on the left hand side, each of them subtly different, and they're all trying out different architectural techniques um, and, and different methods of construction. And so you can see a, a timber hall in the centre here and on the right hand side with quite sophisticated plank work. And this is the point where I always blame the uh, the three little pigs and the fact that um, the, the the three little pigs have given us very much a, a strong cultural impression of the fact that buildings made of wood are somehow inferior to buildings made of stone certainly as far as big bad wolves are concerned um, but really what we need to understand when we're looking at the anglo-saxon period is that it's possible to create incredibly sophisticated buildings from timber and we're looking here at a people who were used to building in timber. That was the main material they used. And so when we see the contrast with the, the stone built Roman period, for example, um, it, it looks very poor. But when we start to think about the sophistication of what's being done in timber here, um, it's no less sophisticated. The problem we have is that archaeologically it doesn't survive very well. And really that's the only difference. So one of the really important things about what's going on at West Stowe, for example, is the fact that it's helping us to visualise what might have been lost. And if you visit the site, it gives you a real sense of what the, the busy banks of the River Lark might have actually looked like during the course of this Anglo-Saxon period. And here's a, a rather wonderful uh, reconstruction, a little watercolour reconstruction of what the, the landscape of the Lark and, and indeed the other river valleys in the, the study area during this period might have looked like. Now when I was I was joking about the, the sign outside the, the, the centre there, I'm sorry if anyone's watching who, who came up with that, but the, uh, the, the idea that it's, that it's the earliest village um, I mentioned that was a, a slight fallacy because one of the things that's become apparent since the excavations at West Stowe is that one of the reasons why West Stowe is exceptional is it's uh, one of the, the main sites that's been excavated so far. And as more excavation has happened, and there's been a lot more excavation within the river valleys for, for development purposes primarily, it's become more and more apparent that West Stowe is only special because it's been excavated. There's nothing special particularly about where it's located or the archaeology that comes from it. It's absolutely typical in that sense of a settlement of this particular period in time. And so, um, for example, uh, when the new museum store was constructed at West Stowe, again, those of you who know the site um, will, will perhaps be familiar with where the, the entrance is um, in relation to the, um, the, the main site. Here's a, here's a plan. So you've got 100 metres on the scale bar here. And so here's the main excavation area that I was just showing you. Up here is the visitor centre and the new uh, museum store, I say new, it was uh, 10 years ago or more now. Um, but here's the footprint of that. And as soon as archaeological work was undertaken for the, uh, the new centre, uh, more houses uh, of, of the hall construction 
uh, the rectangular halls here, and more of these sunken featured buildings were revealed. So the settlement isn't just um, located on the one knoll, it extends along the, the valley side. And further work at other places, such as Culford School, further upstream, again in the same river valley, uh, revealed a, a swathe of, again, sunken featured buildings uh, running across the, the northern bank of the river valley uh, through here. And this is absolutely typical. We're, we're finding more and more and more of these sites demonstrating that the river valleys were incredibly densely settled during this uh, 5th to 7th century period. Another more recent example, again, slightly outside our current study area, but again, absolutely typical, um, is at Kentford, uh, just nestling in uh, adjacent to the, the main trunk road there that you can see in the slide. Um, and again, the excavation plan showing us that very, very typical arrangement of um, timber framed buildings, rectangular halls and sunken featured buildings. And I could show you example after example after example now of this kind of site, which is coming to light again and again and again. And some of them are excavated on a fairly large area, such as the site you can see here. Others, we just get a single SFB within the footprint of perhaps one infill house within a river valley, something like that. Um, but again, it's, it's this growing picture of the density of settlement in those river valleys at this period, which has really transformed our understanding of, of quite how many people are living and occupying these river corridors during this period. And of course, we don't need to be um, you know, ecologists or historical geographers to appreciate why that might be. You know, the, the, I've already mentioned the fact that the river corridors provide um, navigation and communication networks, which are far easier to use than trying to cross the land uh, in terms of effort expended. But of course, they're also absolutely vital to, um, to settlement and development and um, being able to survive. You know, we all need water to survive, but the rivers also provide a, a rich natural resource as well in terms of uh, the, uh, the fish and the, the fowl and the, the sedge that grows on the, the riversides for thatch and other things. Yeah, a very, very rich resource, natural resource, uh, which is being utilised by these early settlers, um, together with other natural resources such as woodland um, and, and obviously their, their farming as well. But really the, the reliance upon those rivers is absolutely crucial to human settlement during this period. Now I've mentioned that um, the settlement in the river valleys is, is very, very, um, very clear. At the same time, we also have uh, an enormous amount, in fact, even more archaeological evidence for the cemeteries from this period as well. Uh, in the early Saxon, we have this real division between settlement evidence, which is hard to see because it's made of wood and doesn't really survive, and cemetery evidence, which is very, very clear, um, primarily because of the use of grave goods and the fact that grave goods survive in the ground because they're mostly metal, and that we've had a long history of metal detectorists working in the region who have recovered that material and reported it. And again, another distribution map, and there's quite a few of those, um, but I, I make no apology for it. And uh, you can again see this tight clustering of cemetery sites again through the river valleys and those cemeteries reflect the areas of settlement, although in this period they're separate landscape entities. So cemeteries and settlements aren't, aren't integrated, they're separate in the landscape. And within the cemeteries we have two different burial rites primarily in evidence. Uh, we have cremation, which is a very Anglo-Saxon act, a very pagan act, and one which comes with them. Uh, and that they bring with us. So this is a very strong cultural uh, identifier. Uh, here's a reconstruction painting of an Anglo-Saxon cremation. I won't go into this in too much detail, but you can see a, a stacked up wooden pyre with the, the body laid out on the top, and uh, that, that's then burnt and the ashes are collected. And within the study area, not far from West Stowe, we have one of the largest cremation cemeteries excavated within East Anglia uh, at Lackford, uh, and this was first excavated uh, uh, coming up to a century ago now and um, just on the hilltop overlooking the Lark and here's the sketch plan of the location you've got north off to the left here but you can see the river Lark running through the top of the uh, top corner in here so you're on a hilltop overlooking the river an absolutely typical location for these kind of sites and coming from the the excavation area we then have uh, a detailed location plan showing you the locations of individual cremation. So each of those dots in that cemetery represents uh, one individual cremation urn. And uh, you can see uh, hundreds, several hundred uh, burials there. 
and you can also see that the whole site isn't excavated as well so and um, there's still a lot more in the ground and, and more come to light um, year on year particularly through ploughing and then this is the kind of thing that we're talking about this is a cremation urn from Lackford uh, it's empty now the, the cremated remains have been tipped out but the pot shows you uh, exactly the kind of evidence that we're dealing with here uh, and these pots are, are locally made and decorated and we're able to take the stamped decoration on here and compare it with other pots and start to recognize um, individual tools being used to, uh, to decorate pots uh, and individual potters at work probably as well or at least a workshop by linking the stamps from one pot to another and there are strong connections within the, the Lackford Cemetery to um, clay and tools found at Rustow for example uh, and the decorative schemes employed here are absolutely typical of a workshop that's become known as the Illington Lackford Potter uh, based on the repetition of designs which are seen um, time and time again across West Norfolk and West Suffolk and, and indeed into Cambridgeshire uh, suggesting that there's something of a, an industry in cremation urns at least uh, building up in this period. So cremation is incredibly important as a, a cultural marker but it also is important because as I say we, we have uh, a major cemetery within the, the study area itself. The other major burial rite that we have um, in evidence at the moment is, is inhumation as well and that's burial in a grave you know that, that's the traditional burial that we would recognize today and uh, again with grave goods and there are many similarities between the Anglo-Saxon cremation burial rite and the inhumation burial rite really the only major difference being that one of them they burn them and one of them they bury them uh, in all other respects there are of great similarities between the two and um, the inclusion of grave goods in, in not all but but many of the graves uh, allows us to say something about some of the individuals interred and so um, for in male graves for example it's very typical for weapons and shields to be placed in the grave Obviously the, the timber rots away, but things like the spearheads that you can see in this slide or the shield bosses survive as, as rusty objects and to be excavated. Here's a photograph of the same thing on the right hand side here. Uh, female graves, it tends to suggest that, that the females are buried in their finest clothing. And again, um, we have an array of beads and buckles and um, wrist clasps. These are essentially um, cufflinks almost for um, an Anglo-Saxon top. And then um, brooches here, which would have pinned a dress together at the shoulders, for example. So we have um, rich female assemblages coming from graves. Uh, in the good old days, they used to do beautiful things like watercolour paintings of the archaeological finds that they, they had. And this is a, a wonderful one. This is from Ipswich. But it gives you a flavour of the sort of richness of colour and variety that perhaps the standard archaeological drawing on the left hand side doesn't quite convey. Uh, we should go back to doing more watercolours in our excavation reports I think uh, but the the point being again that, that we have a, a rich source of evidence for um for for people and their culture um coming through the grave goods included in sites and again we have numerous examples of inhumation cemeteries scattered throughout our current study area um, there's one at West Stow, for example just outside the settlement area uh, which was excavated in the 19th century but we also have one of the largest cemeteries which has been excavated uh, which is is on the brink of being fully published it's actually three large cemeteries excavated within the the footprint of RAF Lakenheath over the course of the last 20 years or so going back to the 1990s and um, three very large cemeteries and you can see the distribution map uh, giving you the the locations of burials in the left hand side here here's a little aerial photograph giving you an indication of the density of burials there as well and this is a, a very early cemetery it seems um, of people who are coming to this western fen edge area and settling and uh, and obviously then um, establishing large settlements and dying in large numbers over a long period of time and again you know we need to remember that although this looks like a lot of burials if you break it up by 200 years potentially it's only two or three a year um, and so there are lots of cemeteries and that begins to add up but the Lakenheath Cemetery, as I've mentioned, is, is on the brink of publication, but has a large number of very, very richly furnished burials indeed, uh, including two uh, burials where a warrior was buried with his horse. And uh, if you go to Milden Hall Museum, you can now see the horse and rider uh, on display there. Some of you, like me, might just be able to remember uh, this being an episode of Meet the Ancestors right the way back in the very early days of, of that television series and, and you can still find that online and watch that. I'll send you a link to that later as well. 
Uh, but you can see in the, the slide on the left hand side here, you've got the, the burial of the warrior here. There's a rusty sword through there. We'll come back to swords a little bit later on and a shield boss. And then on the right hand side of the grave here, you can see uh, his horse laid out as well. And the horse itself uh, had incredibly rich uh, bridal fittings, which survived very nicely. And this one grave, for example, has been able to tell us an enormous amount about horse furniture and, and how the Anglo-Saxons tethered and used their horses during this particular period. So we, we eagerly await the publication of, of that particular site, which is due uh, hopefully within the lifespan of, of this particular project within the next six months or so, uh, and it should be an, an absolutely fascinating volume. Now, moving on through time, uh, as, as indeed we are, uh, we come to the beginnings of the, the Middle Anglo-Saxon period, uh, which is the, the period that runs really from the 7th century through to the 9th century and is the immediate precursor to the, the um, coming of, of the Vikings as well. The 7th century is a period of enormous change within the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon landscape and again um, I'll very, very briefly summarise that here. Um, we could fill days and days with, with discussion about the, the detail of it. But basically, it's a period where we see a shift from uh, essentially the, um, the, the sort of um, transitory, slightly more impermanent settlement of the early Anglo-Saxon period, where uh, fluctuations in uh, environmental conditions and um, slight shifts in settlements resulted in uh, occupation shifting up and down the river valleys to a certain extent and um, during the course of the 7th century the landscape becomes much more fixed and uh, we start to see the establishment of more permanent settlements that go on to become the, the medieval villages and, and the modern villages that surround us today and so um, one of the things that archaeological evidence has shown us is that there are very very few settlements uh, which are in existence today, which have their origins right the way back in the early Anglo-Saxon period that I was just talking about before the break. Uh, almost all of the settlements, in so far as we're able to tell, um, that have been excavated uh, up to this present day, um, have their origins during the middle or the later Anglo-Saxon period. And we have at the end of the Anglo-Saxon period a, a very detailed snapshot of the East Anglian landscape provided by the Doomsday Survey recorded in the pages of Doomsday. Uh, and that gives us the, the, uh, the landscape as it was in 1086. And we can see from that that almost every aspect of the East Anglian landscape that we recognise in terms of the major settlements and the routeways and uh, the, the, the parishes and the, the hundreds and everything else, almost all of that was in place by the time the Normans arrived. And so the, the later part of the Anglo-Saxon period from the seventh century onwards is really where we see the emergence of the East Anglian landscape as we understand it today. And so um, it's an immensely important period of time as far as we're concerned, but it's also uh, the, the longevity of it is frustrating from an archeological point of view, because what it means is, and this was one of the questions that popped up in the, the chat as well, it, what it means is that a lot of the crucial settlement evidence that we're looking for from the seventh century onwards is actually buried underneath the later settlements and indeed the current settlements that, that we still live in. And so from an archeological point of view, it's much, much harder for us to be able to access that information and understand those sites. And where the opportunity to excavate such a site is presented, um, we, we seize it uh, with both hands uh, because it, it's such a rarity to be able to excavate a site of this Middle Anglo-Saxon date, primarily because they tend to then survive and, and continue uh, as settlements into the later periods. But what we, what we are able to do, and again, here's the historical atlas of Norfolk giving you a, an overview. What we are able to do is use, again, the metalwork from the detectorists, um, but also use um, pottery scatters as well, um, based on Middle Anglo-Saxon pottery, which is known as Ipswich ware, and which is made in Ipswich. And we won't really talk about Ipswich today, but we'll talk about Ipswich more in the next session where we look at the impact of, of Vikings on towns in particular. Um, but from the 7th century onwards, we start to see the rise of Ipswich as the major trading port in southeast Suffolk. Um, but over in the west here, uh, we see a much more um, 
fluid economy, if you like, and with many more um, trading centres than just one major urban centre. It's quite interesting that the western part of, of Norfolk, the western part of Suffolk, doesn't really have a major town in this period. Uh, over in the, the east you've got Norwich, you've got Ipswich, um, in the west here we, we have a much um, looser string of, of sites which seem to perform the, the functions of towns in, in different ways. Uh, and that's what this map is reflecting. So we've got uh, a series of key sites at places like Wormagy and Borsey, for example, West Walton, and then large numbers of, of settlement sites scattered again down the river valleys. But you can see from the distribution here, also spreading further inland and starting to move into those higher regions that weren't uh, colonised in quite the same way during the early Anglo-Saxon period. Now, the reasons for that, as I said, are, are many and varied, and we, we won't go into those in detail today. But this is the period where we start to see um, the establishment of permanent settlements. We start to see the foundation of, of churches and monasteries. and We start to see the rise of, of kingship and lordship and uh, the establishment of um, estate centres and land which people own and uh, the sort of long term holding of land. And so it sees a, a radical transformation of the East Anglian landscape. The corresponding map of Suffolk looks a little blank. I mentioned that this is slightly older. Uh, if we were to redraw it from modern data, uh, it would have a lot more information in it. And, um, but again, you can see that South East Suffolk concentration, primarily in this instance, a reflection of fieldwork, uh, a lot of fieldwork taking place around the area of Sutton Hoo and Rendlesham. But again, coming further over to the west, you can see um, fewer of these middle Anglo-Saxon settlements marked. Um, there is Brandon, and we'll be coming to Brandon in a minute because it's an incredibly important site. Um, but you can see again a bit of a gap on the map at this point of time in, in West Suffolk. Um, that gap has been addressed to a certain extent uh, in recent years through additional fieldwork. And again, uh, that's something which we can look at in more detail when we start to produce the, uh, the, the details for the, the booklet that we want to write, because these are the kinds of issues that we want to be including. Now, I mentioned Brandon, and I also mentioned the fact that um, there are very, very few sites which we've been able to excavate to any great degree, because once you get to the seventh century, settlements tend to stay occupied. But one very nice exception to that is the site at Brandon, because the Middle Anglo-Saxon phases at Brandon um, are on a slightly different location to the, the later medieval town that grew up. And so um, towards its periphery, there's a site called Staunch Meadow, which uh, due to detecting in the 1970s and early 1980s, was recognised as being an important archaeological site, and which was then um, subsequently excavated by the Suffolk Archaeological Unit. And uh, I'll talk you through the details of the excavation in a moment, but the, the monograph was published a few years ago now and is an incredibly important piece of work. Um, Sue Anderson, one of the authors, is, is with us today, so I shall make sure I do it justice. But I'll send you a link to the online version of the, uh, of the monograph as well, um, because um, we can then, uh, I can then point you towards that and you can read it at your leisure. Um, but basically the site at Brandon is one of the most important archaeological sites that we have in the region, um, if not the nation, for this Middle Anglo-Saxon period, because not only is it um, able to have been excavated and, and large portions of it still remain as a scheduled monument in the ground, um, but also because of the quality of the survival of the evidence as well. Um, you can see on the left hand side here the excavation plan, uh, which is there's a scale bar here, uh, which I think is giving you 50 metres, so it's quite a large area that was excavated. And again, we're seeing all the features at once here. So all the ditches, all the pits, all together. But mixed up in that, you're looking at about 200 years worth of occupation. And again, this idea that timber buildings last for about 20 years at a time um, before they're replaced um, helps us understand that we're looking at a longer period of time here. So on the right hand side, what you can see are some of the individual plans of buildings which have been pulled out from that excavation. Uh, of different sizes and shapes as you can see and at the bottom here a bit of a clue as to what might be coming but you can see uh, churches highlighted as well the footprints of timber churches have been identified on this particular site with associated cemeteries and you can see sort of waving the pointer around on the screen hopefully you can see that uh, there's an area of cemetery here next to one of the churches and then there's a second area of cemetery up here uh, with a, a um, 
a church off outside the area of the site. So the excavation itself, incredibly important, and the results even more so. But I mentioned it was a very rare survival. You can see the depth of the topsoil here is very, very shallow indeed. Um, one good ploughing and all of this evidence would have disappeared. So the fact that the site remained and was undisturbed for so long uh, makes it incredibly important. And as I say, the fact that it was excavated on such a large scale and with such care, again, really adds to the, the significance of that particular site. And it's, as I said, become one of the type sites for this kind of thing uh, that we go to across the region and, and more widely, uh, and remains one of the most important archaeological sites that, that we have in the region. And it's right within the study area for this current project, which is rather nice as well as a, an extra detail. Now, within that um, complicated excavation plan, uh, it's possible to go through the uh, the details of the different um, the different archaeological phases and identify um, periods of occupation within the site. And so, the next few slides just basically skip you through the development of the area over time. And I won't go into the detail, but what I'll do is is certainly point you towards the the monograph because there's a very detailed discussion of the changing layout of the site and particularly the, the changing authority behind the site in terms of a landowner who has the power to, to redesign the site over time and, and the changing um, control of the site as well. So in its earliest phases it belongs to the mid 7th century so it's a, it sort of follows on from the end of the period at, at Westo for example and you can see a sort of basic um, riverside settlement with a, a ditch around it uh, surviving uh, in its earliest phase. And then as you move through the 8th century, the excavator is able to identify uh, a relocation of the settlement focus within the site, the creation of different ditched enclosures with animal enclosures and possibly animal pens and so on as well, but still very much a sort of typical um, agricultural riverside settlement, if you like, in terms of the, the features which survive. But then we see a major shift within the, the 8th century, so the 700s, um, where we see the foundation of that building that I've already showed you identified as the church and uh, with the cemetery next to it, uh, with another enclosure and a causeway leading back to the, the mainland. And, and then we have numerous houses laid out or, uh, and bakery possibly as well, agricultural buildings laid out uh, on a, a more regular orientation within the wider area of the site. And so in that sort of mid eighth century period, we can see a radical shift, if you like, in the design and control of the site. And we also see the introduction here of a religious focus as well in the form of a church and a cemetery. Now, of course, this is the period where a lot of the region's churches and cemeteries are probably being founded uh, in the first instance, not necessarily all of them by any means, but um, perhaps a larger number than we've previously appreciated. Uh, but of course, the other difficulty we have with churches, the same as with settlements, is that many of them then stay on the same site. And so it's difficult to access these earlier phases which lie beneath the later building. But for reasons we'll come to, that's not the case at Brandon, because over time the, the settlement drifted away, it failed and drifted away, and allows these phases to be accessed. Now, just to give you a couple of detailed views of the, the church very briefly, um, here on the left hand side you can see. The, the post holes and the, the beam slots, which represent the footprint of that particular building, uh, with a second phase over the top of it. You've got a, a slightly different rectangular shape in there. And then on the right hand side, you've got the, the, uh, the archaeological drawing of the same, um, giving you an indication of the design of the building. Uh, it's tempting to see that the chancel at the, the eastern end and perhaps a baptistry or something at the western end. Uh, you've got opposing doorways north and south and then a, an entranceway through and obviously as I said you've got an associated cemetery just outside the door as well so I think we can be pretty uh, conclusive that this is an Anglo-Saxon church from the, the middle Anglo-Saxon period and a very rare survival it is too. Now as we go through the history of the site um, into the ninth century we see another redesigning uh, we see that original church and cemetery fall out of use and we see a new cemetery uh, being established nearer to the riverside and again a, a redesigning of the boundaries within the site and this is interpreted again as being a, a change in the ownership and control of the site and it's seen as becoming a much more developed 
uh, monastic site even uh, by this late phase and again there's a very detailed discussion of this that we can go into in the, the excavation monograph. And then one of the most interesting things in some ways about the Brandon site is that by the time we get to the, the later part of the ninth century uh, we begin to find that the site falls out of use and there's uh, large uh, rubbish heaps accrued across the site and, and but the buildings basically stop being used and the site is effectively abandoned um, during the late ninth century and the fact that the site is abandoned in this fashion uh, is basically the the main reason why a thousand years later or so um, archaeologists were able to come along and excavate it so entirely uh, because the remains haven't then been disturbed by subsequent settlement being constructed over the top and it's not until the later part of the Anglo-Saxon period and into the medieval period that Brandon as we know it today um, begins to grow up um, slightly offset from the original settlement focus within the staunch meadow site. And of course that then brings us uh, very nicely on to some of the reasons why that site may have fallen out of use. And of course uh, I mentioned uh, interpreting the function of, of the Brandon site as being absolutely crucial. Uh, one of the reasons why the, uh, the site was investigated in the first place at all was because of the discovery of this object, uh, which is now, uh, now lives in the British Museum. Uh, but this was discovered by a detectorist before the excavation started. Uh, it's a little gold plaque, a uh, little tiny thing, a couple of centimetres across really, um, and you can see on there the um, eagle-headed uh, John the Evangelist, and um, we know that because it says uh, Saint Johannes Evangelista uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the Latin inscriptions, it was nice when they labelled them, um, but we would recognise the imagery anyway, uh, and you can see in his hand he has a stylus in one hand and a, uh, a wax tablet uh, in the other ready to write his gospel. Now this um, we are assuming that um, that the, the, uh, the this is one of a set of four and you can see why we might think that um, and we're assuming this is a book plate or some sort of decorative uh, book plate probably coming from the cover of an anglo-saxon bible and so an incredibly important discovery uh, in its own right but the implications of what that is telling us are even greater you know this is one of a set um, but it's also indicating the presence of, of um, liturgical texts being held on the site. And this is a really important thing. This is a period where East Anglia is really being written off as something of a backwater, um, whereas the more and more evidence that we find of things like this is really serving to indicate that, that East Anglia in this period, although we don't have a lot in the way of, of written records from this period, uh, we do have a lot in the way of material records that demonstrates that um, there's quite a sophisticated religious infrastructure in place within East Anglia during this period and that the, the characters involved and the sites involved are participating on national and international stages when it comes to um, the development of, of monasticism in particular um, but also the sort of wider religious practices. And there's a particular concentration of important sites within West Suffolk and West Norfolk, including Brandon, which allow us to, to understand that. And of course, if we go further west uh, into the Fens as well, we end up at Ely, which again is, is another very, very significant site in terms of early religious landscapes. And that whole watery landscape of the Wash area and the Fenland area is incredibly important to our understanding of the development of monasticism during the Anglo-Saxon period and so um, Brandon makes that contribution. Now other artifacts from Brandon also as well as this plaque, um, artifacts from the excavations also hint at its high status and that, that there's important work going on here. Um, you can see the stylus in the hand of St John here. Um, here are other examples of, of Anglo-Saxon uh, styli which were found during the excavations and again um, some rather ornate examples. Um, basically the, the pointy end for scratching onto a wax tablet, the, uh, the flat end then for smoothing it, it flat afterwards. It's a, a tool for, um, for writing and recording, but particularly for learning to write, for practicing um, and for making temporary marks rather than permanent marks. And there's a lot of discussion being had over the last sort of 30 or 40 years about whether styli particularly indicate monasteries or whether they indicate high status um, and whether they indicate literacy and so on. But um, certainly in the case of Brandon, the examples that we've got here um, indicate all of those things. But in addition to the styli 
And what we have which are particularly nice are these. Now these are little fragments of glass that belong to ink wells. And we can tell that from the residues on them as well as their shape. Um, and so we can see that at the Brandon site, in addition to scratching on wax tablets, we also have people using ink and pens in order to create manuscripts. And this then provides a context for that um, biblical uh, plaque, the little gold plaque that we saw, and indicates that really here we are dealing with something that is particularly special. On the right hand side you can see another example of an inkwell. This one isn't glass and I should say glass is a rare material in this period as well uh, and beautifully made. But um, on the right hand side here you have an antler tine, uh, the end of an antler, on which you might just be able to make out through here there is a runic inscription. It's one of several artifacts from Brandon which have runic inscriptions and uh, it's hollowed out and so it's used as an inkwell. Uh, it, it, so it's used in inkwell as, as well. Um, but the nice thing about the riddle on here is that it can be read and it says um, I grew on a wild animal is, is what it says and this is one of those nice um, Anglo-Saxon riddles that we see uh, and we're able to basically read the, the message that the, the owner perhaps of this inkwell has carved here you know, some 1200 years ago or more. And it's a little joke, a little play on words about the fact that it grew on a wild animal. But again, we have this indication that um, ink and, uh, and um, scriptoria are, are in evidence at, at Brandon. So an incredibly important uh, site in that regard. And I think again, goes on to show how even perhaps the most uh, innocuous looking archeological artifacts in terms of the fragments of glass, for example, can unlock a very large and very important story. And the monograph is full of that kind of thing. So I'll send you the link for that afterwards. And that's something that I would certainly encourage you to, to take a good look at. But of course, that then brings us on to, to the, the, the main point of the second part of, the, of the, the, the discussion here is the coming of the Vikings. Because it can be no coincidence, really, that, that the site at, at Brandon uh, on the river, an important uh, monastic site, uh, falls out of use during the the period which is historically documented as being the first coming of the Vikings to the region and I think we do need to see a direct causal effect there in terms of the abandonment of the site and so what I'm going to do for the last half an hour of this particular session is just focus on some of the evidence that we have for the, the historical evidence that we have for the coming of the Vikings to the region and then start to look at some of the archaeological evidence that we have for that initial phase of, uh, of occupation and settlement and then as I said at the start the second session in a few weeks time will pick up the story and we'll look at the consolidation of the Viking settlement how during the later Anglo-Saxon period there was in this integration of the, the Viking uh, people and culture into the East Anglian landscape and how we might actually read that uh, in the East Anglian landscape. Um, so the, the coming of the Vikings, uh, I've put in uh, this particular picture because um, again I mentioned earlier on with the coming of the Anglo-Saxons that there's been a, a great deal of debate over the last uh, sort of generation or two about what that might have looked like in terms of was it a, a mass um, displacement of people? Were there lots of Anglo-Saxons? Was there lots of bloodshed? Or were there a few Anglo-Saxons and was it largely cultural? Um, we have a very similar um, set of arguments be going around with the degree to which we believe what's been written about some of the Viking raids. Um, and it's important to remember that uh, a lot of the descriptions that we have are written by monks and not really by anybody else. And so we have quite a partisan view of, uh, of what was happening. Um, but I include this picture, this is from a book called Looking at History uh, by R.J. Unstead, which was published in the 1950s. Uh, and this is the school book that I learned. I, was, I wasn't in the 1950s, but um, I found an old copy when I was a child and uh, used to read it avidly. And this was the full colour paid illustration of the Viking raids. And you can see all of the sort of characteristic tropes that we've come to associate with Vikings in the popular imagination. I think we can blame Kirk Douglas for quite a lot of this as well. Um, but you've got the, uh, the winged helmets, for example, you've got the burning churches, you've got the monks being put to the slaughter and so on. And you've got um, people being robbed in the background, horses being stripped and taken away. 
all the treasure being collected in the foreground and so on. And again, this is a sort of very, very typical view of, of how a, a Viking raid is, is seen. And there may be an element of truth in, in that, of course. Um, but at the same time, uh, the archaeological evidence doesn't necessarily always support this. And certainly at Brandon, we don't see any evidence of sort of heaps of bodies or burning or anything like that from this particular period. It seems to be a much more low key and gradual um, integration and, and takeover. Um, so these, these older images, perhaps um, less instructive. But just to turn to the, the actual evidence that we have for a, a moment, just to give you that context. Um, what we've got here uh, is a, a crucial entry in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, uh, which gives us the historical framework for this particular period. Um, and um, we're looking at this particular period at the year 866. And this is, or 865, 866, and this is the, the first recorded instance of the Vikings coming um, into East Anglia. And so for the, the entry in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which as the name suggests, um, is um, a, uh, a, a sort of detailed calendrical list of events that happen uh, one year after the next. And so for this particular entry, 866, uh, and the same year, a great heathen army came to England and took up winter quarters in East Anglia. And there they were supplied with horses and the East Angles made peace with them. So this is recording the first of the Viking incursions into East Anglia. And you can see in the map on the, the left hand side um, that we've got, uh, again, this is the sort of dad's army approach to history, as you can see, but it gives you the, the great heathen army arriving and coming uh, into East Anglia. And here we've got Thetford being uh, identified as the main uh, location. And we'll come back to that um, in a moment. Now, moving on from that first quote, 869. Uh, we can follow their progress. So in this year, the uh, the raiding army went across Mercia and into East Anglia. And so what we can do is we can follow the arrow. So they go in here and they head up to York from East Anglia. And you can see that York is attached, attacked sorry, uh, in 867. And then you can see the arrow coming back down. This way it goes different ways, uh, down to, to Nottingham and back. And then uh, we can see other ways coming back down here to East Anglia. And so the reference that we've got here for 869, in this year, the raiding army went across Mercia, which is the, the, uh, the middle Anglo-Saxon kingdom in here, uh, and into East Anglia and took up winter quarters in Thetford. So here we're having Thetford identified very, very clearly as being the site of the, the overwintering for the great Viking army. And we'll come back to Thetford in a moment as well, because that's one of the, the research themes that we're keen to explore. Uh, during the course of the River Raiders project is what more we can ascertain about the, the Anglo-Saxon periods in Thetford. Um, and that winter, uh, King Edmund fought against them and the Danes had the victory and killed the king and conquered all the land. And this is perhaps one of our most famous uh, encounters with the Vikings, if you like. And I'm going to explore this in a bit more detail for you because the martyrdom of Edmund, the, the, uh, the slaughter of the last of the East Anglian kings, is really seen as being the sort of the end of uh, Anglo-Saxon East Anglia proper uh, before it shifts into this Viking phase. And it's a, an event for which uh, we do have other evidence as well. And I'm sure uh, many of you will be uh, familiar, at least in outline terms, with the events uh, leading up to the martyrdom of Edmund. We've obviously got the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle as a near contemporary source, uh, which gives us the, the sort of bare bones of the story, if you like. Um, but what we also have is, is then a, a, a large uh, hagiographical tradition that grows up around the life and miracles of Edmund. And we have later documents produced uh, within a century or so, which give us the, the story of, um, of Edmund's martyrdom. And uh, again, I'll send you some links to, to some of those and some of the articles that you can read about the history of Edmund and the, the later life and miracles. Um, but crucially, what we have here is this sort of violent uh, interaction with the, with the Viking army. Um, so this is a, a 12th century manuscript from the Abbey at Bury St Edmunds, uh, which is a later part of the story, which we'll, we'll come back to next time. Uh, but this gives us a sort of pictorial history, if you like, uh, of Edmund's martyrdom. And so here you can see um, him being uh, dragged from his throne to go and talk to the, the Danish army. Uh, so, uh, he refuses to talk, he refuses to negotiate, uh, 
Um, so they capture him. You can see here the, the Vikings with their Viking weaponry um, tethering him and, and beating him with sticks. Uh, so the story then goes on that he's then tied to a tree. Uh, and again, you can see them um, wildly attacking him with the, with the, the sticks here. Uh, the hand of God appearing from the clouds up in the corner here, uh, reminding us that um, Edmund uh, is a devout Christian and uh, part of his re well, part of his reasoning here is that he, he wants to have a, a peaceful uh, approach to this negotiation. And uh, then we we get the famous imagery of Edmund's martyrdom itself, with him um, tied to a tree uh, and shot full of arrows. And again, a sort of rather um, graphic illustration of that on the, the left hand side here. Uh, similar to the martyrdom of, of Saint Sebastian, uh, who's similarly shot full of arrows. And um, again, the description uh, from the, the sort of century later um, describes him as being uh, like a hedgehog by the time that they'd finished. And this is seen as being uh, a sort of dastardly act by the, the Vikings. And obviously here they are with their bows and arrows. Uh, as you move through, you then get the illustrations of what happens next. Where having killed him, um, he's then decapitated and uh, the, the head uh, is hidden in a thorn bush. And so here again, the, uh, the Vikings hiding the head. And as the legend then uh, progresses, uh, the Vikings then leave and uh, Edmund's followers come to, to look for his body. And this is sort of the first of the miracles of Edmund is uh, reputedly then that the, the head calls out to his followers uh, that he's here, he's here. And uh, they go into the thicket and they find his head being guarded by a wolf, uh, which is what you can see and uh, being illustrated uh, in here. Uh, just in the, the bottom right of, of that particular image. And the, the story continues. Um, Edmund's body is reunited with the head and miraculously reattaches itself. And he's buried not far from the site of his martyrdom in a, in a timber chapel. Uh, and then uh, subsequently, a, a few decades later, his body is relocated to the site of, of Bury St Edmunds uh, in the early 10th century. Uh, so 50 years later or so and then from that uh, shrine that, that's developed there in the 10th century we then see in the 11th century uh, the establishment of the the abbey in Bury St Edmunds that we know from the ruins of, of the site today so we have that sort of longer term history of what happens next and that's something we'll come back to in the next session as well because the um the, the patronage of the abbey in Bury St Edmunds in the 11th century is very closely linked to the, the rise of the Scandinavian kings in the region. And so it, there's a direct connection, almost an atonement, uh, if you like, for the actions of the earlier Vikings in the course of the ninth century with the martyrdom itself, and then the, the growth of the, the cult of Edmund and uh, his shrine and, and his relics uh, during the course of the 10th and 11th. And we'll look at that uh, in a bit more detail next time. But for the purposes of, of the sort of the immediate onslaught, if you like, we've obviously got the, the story of the martyrdom, an immensely important political event uh, in terms of, of the repercussions that it has for East Anglia and uh, obviously one of the major events in, in East Anglian history. Uh, but of course, the, the entry in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, as well as highlighting the martyrdom and, and, uh, the, and all the, the trappings that come with that, uh, also highlights Thetford as an absolutely crucial site in terms of our understanding of the importance of this particular period and particularly um, the overwintering of the, the Viking army. And the, the area of Thetford itself obviously sits nicely within the, the current project study area and one of the real uh, important stories that I think we want to try and uh, tease out and promote as part of both the River Raiders project um, through the booklet and, and other things is that very significant role that Thetford played during the later Anglo-Saxon period particularly, um, which has largely been forgotten. I think people are a little bit aware of it, but it's not a well-known story. Uh, and the fact that by the time we get to the 11th century, um, Thetford is one of the most um, densely populated uh, towns in terms of religious buildings. Uh, it's the site of the Cathedral of East Anglia for a while before everything shifts to Norwich. And so you know, in the later Anglo-Saxon period, uh, Thetford's a very important place, a really significant settlement. Uh, and that's something which then 
as I say, is, is eclipsed by the rise of Norwich and really is then largely forgotten about um, by, uh, by and large. And so I think the rehabilitation of Thetford and its history, if you like, is something that we're keen to engage with as part of this project. And so the, the map that you can see on the screen here, again, is from the Historical Atlas of Norfolk, and it's giving you a, uh, a, a view of our understanding of the, uh, the early site and origins of, of Thetford. And those of you that know Thetford, you'll be familiar with the fact that we've got um, an Iron Age fort. You know, so again, this is part of a much longer story. Uh, you've got an Iron Age fort here, uh, which sits on a promontory, uh, which overlooks a ford. And so here you have a confluence of ways. You have a, 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 an east-west river valley, uh, which, which runs through the centre of the settlement. And you then have north-south routes as well that cross at the various fords. This is Thet Ford, of course. And uh, so you have the, the fords that run through. There's one just under the, the castle, by which I mean in the river, you know, over which the, the castle site looks, the Iron Age Fort, subsequently a medieval castle. And then there's another ford in the centre of the town as well that we now recognise as the, one of the main bridges. So in terms of communication links, Thetford is absolutely crucial in terms of its landscape setting with um, river networks and road networks uh, converging at the town. And it's been occupied since the Iron Age period. There are um, extensive Roman uh, settlement evidence from uh, around the area as well. And then it's particularly during the later Anglo-Saxon period that we see the birth of Thetford as a settlement as we come to know it uh, in the later periods. And that's what the black line on here is giving you. The black line on here is giving you the line of the Anglo-Saxon defences of Thetford. And these really took the form of a bank and a ditch and stretches of that still survive. Um, there are earthworks dotted about uh, within Thetford itself, um, tucked in amongst the edges of roads and in between houses and so on, that you can see on the ground. And there are other stretches lost between and beneath the, the later houses, which give you on the north bank this D-shaped enclosure uh, focusing on the ford within which several of the churches are located. This gives you the, the, uh, the sort of tightly focused bit there. And then on the south bank, and this is again the bit of Thetford that's often forgotten about, on the south bank you have this very very large uh, enclosed area here, enormous length of, of bank and ditch, taking in a very large area on the south bank. And this really is seen as being probably the most likely location for the, um, the, the Viking army camp in, in terms of um, where they're likely to have established themselves on the south bank there within this large enclosure. And so within that area, of course, today, a large amount of that area is, is quite significantly developed in terms of um, modern housing, modern buildings and so on. But there is a very, very rich archaeological record from within and surrounding the town that we can get a tantalising glimpse of, of what's going on in Thetford. And one of the things that I'm keen for us to do, and keen for any of you volunteers who wish to, to join with the project to, to do, is to work through some of the archaeological records that we have for the town, some of the discoveries that have been made, some of them going back into the 19th century, and to tease out some of the detail of those sites and those finds, which can help us to shed some light on those Anglo-Saxon phases of the town because the evidence is there uh, and, and it's been discovered in, in piecemeal fashion but to date we don't really have a very thorough history, certainly a very thorough archaeological history if you see the difference, of the development and, and origins of, of Thetford and that's something that I really would like us to, to have a more detailed look at as a group of volunteers and, and work through the information that we have. And when I was saying about the, the possibility of an interpretation panel as well, um, Thetford is one of the places that we're thinking um, that that might go in terms of a panel that um, interprets this phase of, of Thetford's development. So I think Thetford's going to be one of the, the key areas that we're keen to focus on as part of the, the River Raiders project. Um, because you have that, that um, important signposting as a historical source, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle telling us that, that that is the case, that Thetford is the site of the overwintering. Because you have that connection with the Great Army and the fact that um, it's then the martyrdom of Edmund as well, so that links into bigger East Anglian stories, but also because we have an increasing amount of archaeological evidence as well for, um, for what's going on uh, within the, the region. Now I've got this slide in here just to remind me to mention that the, the Great Heathen Army itself, because 
um, outside our region um, at the site called Torxy, which you can see in here in Lincolnshire, and also at Repton as well, which you can see marked here, two other known um, overwintering sites uh, for the Great Heathen Army. Both of those sites, Torxy and Repton, have seen an enormous amount of, of fieldwork and research undertaken, uh, which has allowed us to identify an archaeological signature for the, the army. And uh, again, one of the things I'll send you after the lecture is links to some articles which are available through open access online, where you can read up on the fieldwork that's been undertaken and see how um, different classes of metalwork evidence, for example, and, um, and other types of evidence have been brought together to identify the the overwintering camps and one of the things it would be really nice for us to be able to do as part of the River Raiders project is take the information from those other sites from Repton and Torxy and look at it in the context of what we're seeing in Stepford and try to um, redress the balance if you like in terms of interpreting those later Anglo-Saxon phases in Stepford. Now one of the most exciting things though that we have um, within uh, the eastern region of course as well, is a, a whole phase of our history which I'll, I'll come to uh, in the next lecture as well, um, where we enjoy a period of time uh, under Danish rule as part of the Dane law. Um, and if I just skip back a second, um, those of you who, um, who are familiar with your, your Bernard Cornwell novels for example and the, the Last Kingdom series will be particularly familiar perhaps with the, the history of the, the Viking army and the Viking raids. Um, as you can see from this map, as they work their way through the country, um, ultimately working their way down into Wessex and then um, back through to a major battle um, with the, uh, the forces of, of Alfred and so on at, um, at Chippenham. Um, and that then leads directly to a uh, document called the Treaty of Wedmore, uh, which is signed by Guthrum, having been beaten in battle. Um, and that develops basically this boundary between Wessex and the Anglo-Saxons to the uh, west of the line and the Danes to the east of the line. And that then firmly sets East Anglia within this area known as the Dane law. And again, to return to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for a moment, um, AD 879 uh, tells us that Guthrum and his army went from Cirencester into East Anglia and settled there and shared out the land. And so on this uh, diagram here, you can see obviously the wash shaded in as swamp or alluvium, it's shown as on here, and giving us that fen edge again. Um, but you can see this area here identified as the Kingdom of Guthrum. And so uh, within the region from the ninth, later 9th century onwards, we have through to uh, a, a period of 50 or 60 years where we have this very direct um, Viking control of the, of the region. And one of the themes I want to pick up on in the next session uh, in a few weeks time is the degree to which we can see that control and integration in the archaeological record and how that then leads to the, the developments in the later part of the Anglo-Saxon period that culminate in the events of uh, ultimately the Norman Conquest. And so we'll look at that period uh, in more detail next time. But just to finish off this morning, I want to just quickly dwell upon just some of the archaeological riches that we have within the immediate environment of Thetford, which speak of the first generation of, of Danes, if you like. Um, one of the problems we have as we go through the, the period is that um, they seem to very rapidly integrate into the existing population, into the existing landscape. And so the categories of evidence that we have are, are rather thin and rather varied and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a few weeks time. But there are a few key sites and key discoveries very early on which seem to speak of these first generation um, Vikings within the region and it just so happens that they, they're within and around the Thetford area and so um, one of the most famous that we have is at Sampton uh, was discovered in 1867 as you can see and it's a double Viking burial the report is a bit sketchy, as, as things often were in the 19th century, but the, the double burial seemed to contain the, the, the burial of a, a woman and a man together. And the, the female burial featured this wonderful pair of brooches here. And these are shoulder clasp brooches that would sit and, and hold the top of a, a dress together. These are in the British Museum now. And again, I'll send you links to these so you can look at them in more detail. 
Um, but they're absolutely typical of uh, high status Viking brooches of this particular period. Find them in lots of other places as well, so very close parallels to this. But nothing else really like it from East Anglia. These are a very special find indeed, uh, this pair together. And um, so again, speaking of objects being brought in by a, uh, a first generation settler and one of high status. And then buried uh, in with the, the male burial, I mentioned this as a double burial at Sampton, and we also have this, uh, which is a sword. And this is a, a drawing, um, it's an, an iron sword, so it's rusty. Uh, and this is a drawing which was published, giving us the, the shape and profile of the handle and the, uh, the um, completeness of the blade. But this is an object which is also in the British Museum. Um, and one of the things that, that we're trying to do as part of the project is commissioning some new photography of, of this particular sword, which hasn't been, as far as I'm aware, hasn't been photographed before. Um, obviously, they're locked down at the moment, so we haven't been able to get hold of the imagery yet. Um, but hopefully, again, during the lifespan of the project, we'll get some photographs of this particular object commissioned and be able to publish those for the first time in the, in the booklet. Um, but what we have, we've got 19th century accounts of the discovery, which again, we can go through uh, in more detail. We can identify where the site was on the ground uh, very nicely. The locational details are, are pretty good for this. So we know where it was. Uh, and it's, as I say, right on the riverside, uh, right on the border. It's just into Norfolk, uh, but right on the border and providing uh, an important context for uh, this particular discovery. <coughs> And um, so that's one nice uh, example of, of, of a, uh, an artifact or a collection of artifacts that we need to go into in more detail in order to help unpick the story. And if we're thinking about um, exhibitions at the, the Castle Museum, um, not the Castle Museum, at the Ancient House Museum, sorry, um, then these are the kinds of objects that we might want to, to think about uh, including or, or potentially borrowing if possible. Um, there are replicas in the Castle Museum, which is why I was thinking of that. Uh, and again, there might be scope to, to do a bit more work with those as well, if the, uh, if the unlocking occurs that allows that to happen. But those aren't the only uh, Viking objects that we have in the, in the Thetford area, which again, I was saying about these tantalising glimpses in the records. And this is something which I'm keen to get a group of you together who can then start to go through this in more detail with us so that we can start to, to piece together the history. Uh, the drawing you can see on the left hand side uh, is a small golden ring uh, which was found in 1905, uh, arbitrarily located to Thetford but found within the town and again um, absolutely typical of a high status uh, Viking object. You've got the decoration on one side and then this little sort of clasped uh, ring uh, at, at the back here. Again this is a published drawing, there are photographs uh, available as well and again it'd be nice to, to find uh, a proper context for this in the archives if we can. Uh, and other objects again that speak of a uh, of a heathen army perhaps uh, on horseback, uh, objects like this discovered at Kilverston in the 19th century again found in the river um, but this is a stirrup, an iron stirrup uh, and again this is a low resolution photograph but um, higher resolution photographs it's possible to see the, uh, the decoration on the surface for example. And so um, again, this is uh, identified as being a, a, a typically um, Danish uh, Viking stirrup, uh, one of many, I'm sure, that would have been used and, and lost. And because it's iron, of course, the, the potential is there for it to have rusted away completely. Um, this particular example surviving. And obviously, Kilverston, uh, uh, on the, the suburbs of Thetford, again, where we might expect to find this kind of material. And there are lots of other uh, Scandinavian influence bits and pieces which have come from excavations which have taken place in the Kilverston area as well over the last 20 years or so. And again, we'll, we'll spend some time working through the archaeological archives for those in terms of um, teasing out some of the details and, and bringing those to the, the wider um, sort of popular consciousness, if you like. And then we have this. Uh, which is a, a wonderful object. Again, another sword. Uh, this was discovered in 1953 uh, in a burial just to the side of, of the Berry Road going southwards out of Thetford. Uh, and this perhaps uh, suggests that the, the southern side of the town is, is where we should be looking for, uh, for the Viking camp. Um, this is a large and rusty sword uh, which was found in the grave of a, of a man. Uh, and survives and this is in the Norwich Castle Museum collection now and um, you might just be able to make out from the drawing 
uh, that this sword has uh, these marks uh, showing on it. Uh, and this is because it's what's known as a pattern welded sword. Uh, if I just put the explanatory diagram on the screen there. Um, pattern welding is a, a very high status uh, sword making technique um, in which um, bands of iron are, are twisted together and then hammered flat and then laid in such a way that the, the pattern of the twisting comes through onto the blade. And you can see from the, the cutaway diagram how that works in terms of the individual bars being placed together and then um, hammered and forged into the overall blade that you can see on here. And so although it's rusted, you can still see a hint of that on there. And the pattern welding of that sword um, really puts it into the upper echelons of, of status as a, an object. And um, pattern welding is something which uh, we see reflected in things like Beowulf as well. Um, references to some of the swords in Beowulf uh, would suggest that they are pattern welded as well. And so again, we have this very nice uh, link back to the, um, the, the, uh, the, the Norse sagas and uh, stories like Beowulf, which of course is an Anglo-Saxon story as well. And so during the course of, of the, uh, the next six months or so, again, I'm keen that we should be able to explore uh, in more detail some of these individual objects, but also provide a wider context for them as well. Because really in terms of the, uh, the archeology span of Thetford and its environs, we've only really scratched the surface for want of a better analogy in terms of uh, piecing together the evidence from this uh, period from the, the ninth century onwards to understand the development of the town and the wider landscape around it and that's where hopefully both additional archive research but also um, going back through things like the metal detector finds which have been reported going back through 19th century discoveries and so on um, will bring to light some more of this material so that we can begin to um, tell that story of the important role uh, which Thetford played in both the original um, settlement of the Vikings but also then um, in subsequent generations and we'll, we'll see that. Uh, moving slightly further away from Thetford, um, we do have another example at Middle Harling, which is still Brexy, you know, sort of on the edge of Breckland now, um, but still counts, um, of another Viking burial. This one excavated in the 1980s. And again, uh, a, a burial of a, a man laid out here, um, surrounded by typically Viking grave goods, including a, uh, a prick spur here, you've got a buckle, a couple of buckles, some very typical knives all laid out in the grave as well. And so again this is another example of an excavation where we have a, the chance discovery, if you like, of a, an isolated burial um, with Danish connotations, with Viking connotations. And this is something which again we'll, we'll look at in more detail and uh, use to, uh, to tell that story. And then I'm going to go further afield uh, up to North Norfolk um, because I can't ignore uh, this particular object. This is the little snoring pendant uh, which was discovered in 1999 uh, and this is an absolutely beautiful example of a um, Scandinavian object being brought into this country by a Viking. You know, this, this is manufactured in, in Scandinavia, uh, brought across and lost and we have very very close parallels in um, continental uh, hordes and so on. Uh, in Sweden particularly we, we can find um, almost identical equivalents and this is the kind of object which we can use to say something about that first wave of, um, of incoming Vikings if you like and the impact which they had on the landscape but also the fact that they were bringing their own personal objects with them uh, and that's a crucial distinction to what happens next because um, in the course of the, uh, the next session, uh, which, um, as I say, we'll pick up in a few weeks' time, we're going to have a look at how, having got to that point of the original um, arrival and the settlement at Thetford particularly, and the sort of hinterland there, uh, and the impact which that had on, um, on the political events in, the, in terms of the martyrdom of Edmund uh, and the, the abandonment of sites like Brandon, for example, um, we'll take that as the starting point next time and we'll look at how we can read the landscape of the later Anglo-Saxon period uh, and see the degree to which the, the Scandinavian influence um, took hold and how that um, developed 
uh, within the eastern region. And so within the next session, we'll look at things like the place name evidence that we have, which is obviously a, a very direct clue for um, settlement structure and how uh, all of that, um, that sort of more permanent settlement uh, began to emerge and, and, and settled and took place. And we'll also be looking particularly at some of the artifactual evidence for the, the local manufacture of objects in a Scandinavian style as well. Because again, we have a lot of material uh, collected from across the region, particularly in the form of brooches and decorative metalwork, which speak of, um, of, a, of a market for Scandinavian material that's being met by local craftspeople and, and local producers. And again, it, with metal detecting and, and the vast body of material that we have available to us through um, avenues such as that, uh, we've really been able to transform our understanding of the extent and scale of that influence as well. Uh, across the region. And then towards the end of the next session, we'll also then look at the um, impact which the later phases of Viking raids had going into the 11th century as well, where we see um, significant attacks on places like Norwich and Ipswich, for example, and, uh, and, and those sort of coming to the fore as part of the, the East Anglian story. So um, there's still a lot more to come. It's a lot to cover. We've, we've done quite well for a, a couple of hours and uh, there's a lot more still to come to, to pick up the story. So we've sort of seen the, the raiders element of the, the Viking story. Uh, the next session will look more at the settlers uh, phase of the Viking story. And as I said at the start as well, there's obviously a lot of this project still to come. Uh, if anything that you've heard this morning uh, whets your appetite, then I'll be forwarding on details using the mailing list that, that you joined uh, when you took your tickets out. I'll forward on some details to further reading and articles that are available online, that kind of thing. If you want to pick that up, uh, then do. Um, but also I'm in, in extending an invitation to all of you who are interested to um, join us in the, the next six months worth of research that we're going to try and do as part of this particular project. Um, with a view to, as I say, um, creating a, uh, a booklet which will capture this story and be able to, to, to bring it to the, the popular consciousness, but also to feed into the creation of, an, in, of uh, an interpretation panel and to feed into the creation of an exhibition as well. And so if any of those things is something which might interest you, then please do. Again, I'll include contact details when I uh, send round and uh, hopefully then you can uh, join us for that. And what we'll probably do is, is run that through a series of smaller Zoom sessions for a smaller group. Uh, maybe you all want to join in. If you do, that would be great. Um, but of course, um, that's not necessarily limited to anyone who lives locally either now. Um, this can also take place on a much larger scale. So I'll leave that there and I'll obviously send you the, the details for that um, as and when the, uh, the opportunity arises. So you will be hearing from me uh, for there as well. But for the moment then, um, I'm going to, uh, to stop there. And um, what I would...